Good day, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Teleflex uh, sponsored session today on large bore closure. Very happy to see you here. My name is Chris Buller. I'm the medical director for Teleflex, and my co chair is Dr. Nick Van Meekum sitting next to me here. And, and Nick is really going to chair the majority of the session. I just have a, a few opening comments I thought I'd make um, uh, before I hand it over to, to Dr. Van Meekum. Just to set the table, really, for the discussion, I was reflecting back on how far we've come uh, in TAVI, and in particular with large bore closure, since I was first uh, involved in TAVIs more than 15 years ago. Um, at the time, uh, we had a large bore complication rate, major complication rate, in excess of 10%. And that was in the context of doing 20% of our patients through alternate access, taking out the highest risk 20% and yet having more than 10% major complications. So what's changed since then? You know, obviously the devices are in part the subject for today, but I, I thought to, to place it in context, what has changed at the mega level, of course, is that patients are getting younger, average age is dropping, average complexity is dropping, the sheaths are getting smaller, of course, and the number of cases being done by each individual operator is going up sharply, particularly in the last five years, I think. And, and so the level of, of experience is much deeper. Um, from an imaging standpoint, we didn't do CT imaging of the iliofemoral uh, artery system early on in TAVI. Now it's routine. And not just doing the procedure, but understanding how to interpret those images, the level of sophistication there has gone way up. The use of ultrasound for access is way up. And then procedurally, of course, there's the use of protamine, there's the use of uh, post-closure imaging, uh, whether it be with ultrasound or with, with contralateral imaging. Uh, there is the skill level and the familiarity of, with individual uh, devices, uh, as well as the devices themselves. So that's the context for today's discussion. Nick, I'll, I'll hand it over to you now, and, uh, and I look forward to hearing the, the speakers. Yes, and uh, I would also w want to encourage the participants uh, to be proactive and interact with us. Whenever there are questions, uh, you can use the, the chat master. You can also com come to the microphone and we'll be very happy to, uh, to get uh, and discuss the, uh, the questions. Okay, so I will uh, start by uh, giving an overview of uh, the, ri uh, the randomized control trial data on large bore uh, closure devices. And then we'll dive into um, more specifics uh, tips and tricks, and also uh, um, experiences uh, with Stefan and Magnus, who are uh, high volume users of large bore uh, device closure devices. So, um, starting off, if the microphone, yeah. So, we're going to start off with these randomized controlled uh, data, and these are my conflicts. So, once a benchmark, this is the control study. This was a registry, a retrospective uh, registry, where they collected all uh, suture-based closures of large bore um, uh, access with either pro, pro styles or pro close pro glides or pro stars, and they compared uh, both uh, technologies. Basically, um, the pro glides seem to be better in this multi-center uh, registry than uh, the pro star. But look at the vascular complication rate. Any vascular complication rate was 20%. And also of interest, the use of stenting was 5%. The use of bailout surgery was also 2%. So we can use that as a benchmark and to help interpret the data that uh, we get now from randomized controlled trials. There is also a large meta-analysis on the use of MANTA. And as a matter of fact, MANTA is probably the best studied large bore closure device on the market. We have three uh, larger registries, prospective registries. And if we pull the data, we end up with almost 900 patients. The time to hemostasis was quite short, only uh, half a minute. Major vascular complication rate around 4%. Minor vascular complication rate, again, less than 5%. So if you compare that with the benchmark of suture-based closure, that is definitely less than 20%. Bailout surgery or covered stenting was required in 3.6%. Some, a number that is more or less reflective of what was uh, reported in the control. And operator uh, experience was not associated with excess complications in those registries. And that is important because it attests to the ease of adoption of this technology. 
When we were looking at um, predictors of Manta failure, there was this phenotype that popped out. If a patient was obese and had a small vessel size, that was not, uh, or that was, it seemed to be associated with uh, Manta closure uh, failure. Other um, risk factors were female sex, and the last one was left-sided access. And you will ask yourself, but why left-sided access? Obviously, because the patients had pro advanced peripheral arterial disease. There was a reason why the operator would choose a left-sided approach. There are two randomized controlled trials comparing two proglides versus Manta. There is the MASH trial, which was a joint effort from Rotterdam and Toulouse. And then there was the uh, co choice closure. That was a study in Germany in three sites. In MASH TAVI, more than 200 patients were one-to-one -one randomized to two per, per close proglides or the Manta closure device. And these were uh, the results. So basically, you had no significant difference in access site complications between the two treatment arms, although numerically we had more complications with Manta. What was more of interest, I think, from that trial was that if you look at, um, if you would need additional maneuvers, what would it be? And that's on the far right of the screen. You'll see that um, additional closure devices were required with per close pro style and in a significant number of cases. Whereas we did not have the opportunity of a bailout closure device with Manta because there is no wire left in place when we use this technology. That said, in the majority of cases, if you have a uh, no hemostasis with a Manta, the best remedy is prolonged manual compression. There were some limitations with MASH. Uh, it, the sample size was not appropriate. We had fewer ex uh, complications than expected, so our study was underpowered. There was also, also no systematic use of protamine, and we may this, want to discuss this later on with the panel. Is this a requirement for uh, the use of Manta? And uh, also there was an unbalanced experience with the two techniques because the operators had years of experience with sutures and only one or two years of experience with Manta. Obviously that played a role in the outcome. Then there is the choice closure. This is a German uh, study. Three sites participated, more than 500 patients were included and basically they saw more or less the same thing. Um, if you can see, the, uh, what was important was that um, uh, the majority of patients received protamine, which is off note and is different from uh, the MASH trial. And also, um, you, if you look at additional vascular closure devices, we saw a similar uh, thing as in MASH. More additional closure devices were used in the suture-based arm. So additional closure devices could be either angio seals or uh, another per close uh, proglide. The failure, uh, the, the, there was also the, the definition of vascular closure device failure was not the same for mesh and choice closure. That said, um, vascular access was most commonly obtained using digital subtraction and geography. And that is another important difference between the two trials. In MASH, we were using ultrasound guided access. In choice closure, it was angio guided access in the majority of cases. And this is definitely also something that we may want to uh, discuss uh, later on with the panelists. So in terms of outcome in uh, choice closure, there were more complications, more access side complications and predominantly minor access side complications uh, using uh, the Manta device. But basically this was in line with what we reported in MASH. Uh, it is notable that the number of complications were higher in choice closure than in MASH. So uh, we can also discuss that, whether that has had something to do with um, experience of the participating sites. And this figure typically demonstrates that again, when you need a bailout procedure, it will be a covered stent or surgery with MASH, uh, with uh, Manta, and it will be manual compression or uh, an additional closure device in a significant number of cases when you use suture-based closure. Also, choice closure trial had limitations. There was no ultrasound-guided access, which is important because you want to have 
per instruction for use, an anterior wall puncture, you want to stay away from the femoral bifurcation and you want to avoid focal calcium anteriorly when you want to use a Manta device. Only the 18 French Manta device was used. Obviously, there are two sizes. There's a 14 and an 18. And with uh, 14 French systems, there's no point in upscaling to 18 French when you can use a 14 French Manta. There was a systematic protamine use in all but six patients. That's not really a limitation. And there was, again, unbalanced experience with the two uh, techniques. In terms of uh, device failure, again, uh, you can imagine that with sutures, uh, the typical uh, way of failure is that you tear the sutures or the sutures will not uh, reach to the arteriotomy. Whereas with the manta, you may lose um, the contact of the collagen with the vessel or the anchor on the inside may not uh, reach to the arteriotomy side. And obviously, the bailout maneuvers are different because you have a safety wire with sutures and not uh, no safety wire with the manta. I think an important lesson learned with, uh, from the MESH trial and also from choice closure, is that um, the puncture technique needs to be optimized. And you no longer just want to be under the epigastric artery and above the bifurcation. Preferably, you are also two centimeters away from the bifurcation to have an optimal result with Manta. If you comply to these, um, up these uh, IFU criteria, then, I trust, then trust me, your uh, complication rate will be close to zero. So this is the typical uh, entry port for a Manta. And I think if you do that, if you stay away from the bifurcation, there is no point. So ultrasound guidance is a prerequisite for success for any large bore closure and definitely for the use of Manta. You have to be able to identify the bifurcation in the long axis and then move to the short axis for a safe puncture. So in conclusion, plug and suture based closure uh, techniques are safe. Uh, the strategy selection can be further refined. Some patients might be better served with a manta, others might be better served with uh, sutures. The complication rates are low for both techniques and bailout options are fundamentally different. Thank you for your attention. Would you like to introduce uh, our next, next speaker? Yes, sure. Yeah. So, Shall we continue immediately and then leave the discussion for afterwards? I think so, yeah. Think okay. So, yeah. so then uh, now we're going to move to um, basically the experience from Karolinska. And uh, Magnus, I, I suggest that you also uh, take the microphone and do uh, uh, your presentation uh, under the spotlight. Yeah. So Magnus Sattergen is going to present his uh, experience in 1,000 consecutive Manta patients. Yeah, okay, so thank you. Yeah, so we've seen the randomized control data. So what I'm going to present to you is, uh, is a 1,000 consecutive unselected experience from a single center uh, in Stockholm, Sweden. So these are my conflicts. So this is, these were the setups. So we included in this study all TAVR procedures that were performed at Karolinska between May 2017 and September 2020. And that comprised of 1,048 patients. 48 patients were excluded from the analysis, mainly due to non-femoral access. So major vascular complications in these 1,000 patients occurred in 4.2% of the uh, cases. So this is a true all-comer study. It's 1,000 unselected consecutive patients. No other uh, closure device was used during this study period. And during this study period, we had a 97% transfemoral access. So if you look at the patient characteristics, and I've divided it up here. So on the left-hand side, you see the patients with, uh, without major vascular complication. And on the right-hand side, uh, the patients with uh, major vascular complication. And as you can see, these are the typical uh, TAVR uh, patients that we still see uh, in our practice today. And there are actually no differences uh, in, in, in the uh, baseline characteristics in these patients. So we don't see uh, uh, predominantly females, for example, in, in this uh, analysis. So if we then go back and check on, on vessel size. So the vessel sizes did actually also not significantly 
differ between the complication and non-complication group. There was a trend towards a little bit of a larger sheets being used in the complication group. And if you combine these two into a, a, a ratio, a sheet outer diameter to femoral artery in a diameter ratio, there is actually a, a significant larger ratio in the a group with complication. Again, vessel anatomy, calcification, so skin to artery depth and also the high uh, femoral uh, uh, bifurcations did not influence uh, the outcome. There was a trend towards more anterior femoral artery calcifications uh, in the complication group and this trend was a little bit stronger if you look at the patients that had both anterior and posterior femoral artery calcifications. However, this did not uh, reach statistical significance. So what about preoperative antithrombotic treatment? So there were actually absolutely no difference between the two groups, no matter if you were on NOAC or warfarin or, or aspirin. Uh, basically the same outcomes. Not even if we look at the patients with an INR above 1.5 could we see uh, uh, an increase uh, of complications. So what were then the type of complications that we saw in this register? It's basically very similar to what you have seen in the randomized controlled size. So the most common uh, uh, vascular complications that we saw was a need for a covered stent due to bleeding. At the beginning of the study we could see that more of the complications were treated uh, with surgical treatment so we have quite a bit of, of that as well in our complications. However, as the study progressed, more and more of the complications were actually treated percutaneously. And, and now in our practice, it's very, very rare that we call the surgeons to fix our complication. We had one case of, of vascular, uh, of embolization uh, of the device. So um, outcomes, so there were in, in the, uh, uh, the group of, of complications, there was an increased need uh, uh, for uh, transfusion, so we had an increase of, of drop in hemoglobin, and this also translated to, to an extra day in the hospital, uh, basically, so three compared to two days I mean hospital stays. But more importantly, we could actually see no increase in 30-day mortality uh, in the group uh, with vascular uh, complication, actually zero in, in this analysis. Learning curve, we heard uh, also from the randomized controlled trial that it's probably a quite short learning curve with the device and we could also show this. If we analyzed our first 100 Manta device procedures, at our centers, there were actually no increase in, in, in complications. And also if we analyzed the five individual uh, operators, their first 20 cases, we could also not see an increase in vascular complications. So indicating that there is a short learning curve with the device. So to conclude, so in this uh, uh, 1,000 consecutive completely unselected uh, a cohort of patients undergoing transfemoral TAVR, we could show that the Manta device is, is safe and, and effective and also the uh, majority of the complications were bleedings and occlusions that could be treated percutaneously in the cath lab. The only independent sure. predictor for vascular complications were sheet to outer diameter uh, to femoral uh, artery inner diameter ratio and also there were no increased 30-day mortality in patients with major vascular complications. And finally, uh, this study indicates that the device is easy to use and also a short learning curve. Thank you very much. Thanks, Magnus. I think we're going to keep moving forward and, and then take questions uh, at the end because the talks are very much complimentary. So we're going to pass the microphone now to, to uh, Dr. Stefan Togwa Togweiler. Stefan, you've had an interesting experience uh, with, with uh, closure, uh, with sequential publications that were quite different from one another. So we're looking forward to, to hearing your, your yes, experience. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Chris. And I will have some similar outcomes than my previous speakers, but also some uh, different. And the topic is why my experience differs from choice closure. Um, these are my disclosures. So we have already seen uh, from Nicolas the choice closure study. It was a randomized study, so it's, uh, it's always good to have randomized data available. Randomizing 516 TAVI patients undergoing transfemoral TAVI to either a plug or a suture-based uh, closure, uh, so the Manta or the ProGlide. And you have already seen the results, and I will not go into details here, but you see the main endpoint was vascular closure associated minor or major vascular uh, complications, and this occurred in 19% in the Manta group and in 12% in the ProGlide group. And this was st statistically significant different. So, as you also can see, that uh, is that most of these complications were minor vascular complications, and in fact, the, def uh, the, the assessment of, of the groin was quite uh, rigorous, and that's why we see slightly higher complication rates in this trial with both devices than we usually see in other trials. Now. Um, also, the minimal artery, ephemeral artery diameter was 7.8 plus minus 1.6. That means there's about a quarter or a sixth of patients actually have a, a minimal artery diameter of uh, 6 millimeters or less. And we have severe calcification in 30% of patients. Now, the plus is certainly this is a randomized trial. It's quite a large number of patients. There are all comers. They included a lot of patients, and these are experienced uh, large volume centers. So I think they did a good job. And the minus is, as said before, ultrasound guided puncture was only performed in a minority of patients, and we uh, see predominantly minor complications, so a lot of hematomas uh, that may not affect the short or long term outcome of the patient. Now, I show you our experience in Lucerne, and we have used the Manta close to 500 times now. And when I use a device, I want to know, do I use it the right way? Do I use it the best way? And that's why I collect the data and then I'll, I'll analyze the data. And so the first thing I want to show you, and we have also seen this before, is the time to hemostasis. So with the Manta, we have almost 80% of patients with immediate hemostasis as opposed to 34% with the ProGlide. And then within five minutes, we have more than 90% of patients with hemostasis, as opposed to about 80% with the ProGlide. So the rate of immediate hemostasis, and you will see this if you use the device, is much, much higher with the Manta. Of course, we also had complications. And as I said, we have uh, almost 500 Manta implants now. In Lucerne, we also do almost 100% TF. So uh, really, uh, we aim for 100%. And we use the Manta in 85% of cases, so not 100. Uh, the good thing is we have a registry which is also clinical event committee adjudicated, so these are good data. And this is our overall experience from the first Manta to the last Manta, and we see that we have a major vascular complication rate of 4%, a minor of 3%, and 93% have no complication. Now, what is different to the previous presentation by you, Magnus, we actually did have a learning curve. And this is our learning curve. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Very suddenly. Yeah, so when we started 2018, and you can see in the first year we had actually a few complications, and then already 2019 it was much better, and now we're consistently at the complication rate, overall complication rate of 4%, and that's exactly what we have seen before, and what we have also seen in the, in the study. So what, why did we have the learning curve? What happened with these patients? And we have summarized this in a publication, and if you start with the Manta, I would recommend that you read it, because it shows some complications that can happen and that we also experienced. So A shows a perfect puncture and a perfect closure. It's away from the bifurcation and away from the inguinal ligament. 
In B, you can see a narrow artery that is calcified. Now the toggle of the mantle is about six millimeters wide, and you can imagine if your artery is only five or four millimeters and it calcifies, the toggle can actually get stuck when you pull it back. And then you have elevation of the toggle, you have usually immediate tr uh, thrombus formation and it's extremely hard to open it percutaneously, if not impossible. Usually you have to call the surgeon. Um, so that's why we actually don't use the menta if we have a very small artery that is calcified at the puncture site. Then we do go with proglides. In C, you have a puncture that looks sort of okay, but it's close to the dense inguinal ligament. And here, if you bring down the plug, it can actually interact with the or, or it, it can prevent complete deposition and you can still have uh, retroperitoneal bleeding because the inguinal ligament is not sealing perfectly with the artery. The blood can actually go under uh, the ligament and although your puncture is, is lower than the inguinal ligament, you can still have retroperitoneal bleeding. And then in D, uh, you see pseudoaneurysm formation. You may not notice this. It's because the plug is not completely uh, pushed down. The patient may be fine because your puncture channel is sealed, but once the patient ambulates, you can have delayed, uh, actually quite severe bleeding. Um, so these were some of the complications that we have and that we learned from. And now, when we look at our further experience, so the first 100 patients, we had it, uh, in total, you can uh, see here, 11% complication, 11 complications. With the second 100, we had two complications. So 11 from 11 to 2, how did we improve? We paid more attention with our puncture. We really aimed for a puncture exactly in the middle. We did not puncture too low. We did not puncture too high. And we avoided patients with a very calcified small uh, iliofemoral anatomy, especially the common femoral uh, anatomy. And with that, we were able to reduce um, the, the complication rate to 2% with the next 100 patients, so a dramatic uh, improvement. So in summary, uh, we have to understand the Manta closure and of course the choice closure trial, which is a great trial. Um, Precise ultrasounded puncture is very much uh, important. It's probably more important with the Manta than with the proglides. And I would still recommend that you check the, the height of the puncture with fluoro. You can see the femoral head also with the ultrasound, but I still recommend to check the height because especially if you're starting with ultrasound guided puncture, it's actually easy to be too high with your puncture because you want to see your needle in the ultrasound and people are tending to puncture quite high. And then we have to keep away, as Nicholas has shown in his initial slides, from the femoral bifurcation and the inguinal ligament. So this, the sweet spot is sometimes quite narrow. And we have, we probably should await small arteries. Yes, you can do it. Magnus, you have shown you, you have done all comers. It's possible, but I would still recommend if you have a very small anatomy, like a four millimeter artery that is calcified, then I would not use the device. And uh, it's very important to know the possible complication that can happen. Don't be afraid of the possible complications because usually you can still treat the patient, but you cannot use the same wire once you have uh, inserted the mantle. So you have to go either ipsilateral with a new puncture or you have to go contralateral. But overall, we are very um, convinced of the device. I really like the fast hemostasis, but you have to know how to use it and when to use it. Thank you very much. Excellent talk. Um, I hope you all agree that uh, the three talks were quite complementary. Um, I think there is quite some consistency in uh, the data, but also in the interpretation of the data. And um, I think one of the main uh, highlights uh, is that we can now come up with best practices. So. Um, if, if we just focus on, on best practices, Magnus, in, in your opinion, how do we need to obtain access? Is it fluoro guided? Is it ultrasound guided? Is it just manual uh, palpation? Uh, what do you think is the, is the recommendation? Well, I, I mean, honestly, I think the poke and hope technique is not a part of TAVR in 2022. This, this should be gone. I mean, uh, uh, Access should always be uh, ultrasound guided, I think. I think to use uh, uh, contralateral side and do an angio, that could, could work, but it's by far 
not as good as ultrasound guided. I think, like Stefan mentioned, I also also fluoro. My, I double check my, my puncture site on floor as well to make sure I'm actually at the femoral head. Uh, because I think, again, although I've been doing this for many years now, I sometimes actually uh, make mistakes. So I think this is a, uh, is a good to double check. But ultrasound guided puncture uh, should be uh, uh, the way to go, especially for a month. But I think for all accesses uh, today in the cath lab. And it is important what you say. We all make mistakes and we, sometimes we do need to make adjustments. And I think in that regard, it might be very wise to confirm your puncture also using fluoroscopy. Uh, I must say I don't do it routinely, so I do routinely ultrasound guided access. In obese patients, I will make a systematically an angio after I got access, mm -hmm. just to make sure that I am away from the bifurcation and also that I am uh, really covering the anterior wall, that I don't have a sidewall uh, stick. Um, is, this, is this also your practice or do you make an angio after you obtain the access? Yes, um, not only in obese patients, but also in patients mm. where I'm not sure, patients with high bifurcations, patients with low inguinal ligaments, uh, so low take, uh, takeoff of the inferior epigastric artery, then we do an angiogram just to make sure we have a good puncture. Mm -hmm. And if not, we can either, we, we close it with one proglide or we, we go uh, on the other side with our main uh, big sheath. Yeah, the the one difference that I um, observed with the data that you presented, with what uh, the registry show us, and also with the data from Magnus, is the learning curve. Um, yes. <laughs> we we haven't seen a learning curve. Also in uh, no. in Stockholm, no. there was no learning curve. Uh, what, what what is your thoughts about that? Because I I have the impression that uh, it is quite easy to teach how to perform a mantra. I think the issues arise when you lose the discipline exactly. to follow strictly each step of this, these best practices. What, what is your comment on the learning curve? Yeah, we just have a poor discipline. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think, uh, well, we, I think every device does have uh, some learning curve, to be honest. And although I agree that the Manta, you can use it straightforward, it's not complicated, still there is a, a feeling uh, with it. So how much tension do you apply? How, how fast bring you down the plug? Mm -hmm. How much uh, then, when the plug is down, how much tension then you put on? And we started, and this, the, I didn't uh, show this, but uh, this was actually a multidisciplinary uh, experience. So the vascular surgeons were using it as well for their for their TEVAR, or EVAR. And they actually sometimes use two Menta because they have one very large and one smaller access. And so we collected data from about seven operators. Uh, so it was really like 100 cases sounds like a lot, but it's actually only a handful of cases per operator. And if ev every operator has one complication, which I think is fair, everybody can have a complication, then you are already at uh, almost 10%. Mm -hmm. and and really, the, the, this, this uh, meticulous analysis of the complication helped us to understand where and how does it happen and helped us to improve with the next 100 patients to 2%, which I think is really a, a good achievement. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I, I would also maybe mention that I know that also from colleagues, they have had complications with the Manta, and it doesn't mean that they're that they're bad operators. I think on, yeah, everybody can have, even very experienced people have complications, otherwise you're just not doing enough TAVI. Yeah. A major adjustment that we made later on in our experience was the systematic uh, use of protamine. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning we, we definitely did not do that uh, because we were afraid of, of complications such as um, stent thrombosis in patients who had recent stents or, or other kind of thromboembolic phenomena. Uh, but that really has changed. So now in, in, in my side, we, we will use protamine in all our cases. Is that the same? So what you do? I have, we've made the same. Actually, in, in this uh, uh, registry, uh, the majority of patients did not receive protamine, but we have made the same experience. So we're also now using protamine in 100%, mm -hmm. I mean, almost 100% of the cases. Stefan, a, a question about, about your predictors of complications. 
one of the things about studies of closure devices is that we, of course, we attribute all the complications to the closure device, but actually it's a journey from the puncture mm -hmm. through the large sheath all the way through to hemostasis and ambulation. Um, do you think that the, that the relationship between the uh, uh, sheath artery ratio and complications is a closure device issue or is that a sheath arterial injury issue? I think it's the, la the latter. Yeah. yeah. It, it's hard to tease that apart, of course. And, and, it's, and it's, I mean, it's hard. It's, it's a registry of one device. Yeah, Obviously, yeah. We, we, to, to really investigate this, we need to, uh, I mean, to, to compare with another device in the same setting then. But I, I do think it's, it's, a, it's a patient and sheet issue. Yeah. It but, has and, been and, and, shown with the ProGlide studies yeah. uh, exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. So I fully agree it's, a, it's an anatomy issue rather than a technical issue with the closure device. We have a question from the audience. Hi, good, good, good morning. I just uh, thank you for your presentations. I would like to hear your, your insight about there is some perception, at least in my center, concerning an increased rate of device failure with the 14 device, uh, with the 14 French device. Um, it's not my experience, my personal experience, but it's my, my, my um, the experience from many of my colleagues. And there's a tendency to not to use the, 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 14, the, the 14 French device. Do you have any insight on that in your personal experience? Or, or do you, can you find any plausible reasons for that? Because I honestly cannot. <laughs> so, so my first uh, question to you then would be, uh, what kind of uh, tower design do you use? Do you use Sapiens? Do you use Evolutes? And we use, uh, we use uh, basically all the platforms of, uh, in the market. But uh, when, when, we, when we use smaller uh, devices, it's, it's counterintuitive to go to an upper, uh, uh, to, to do an upsize in the, in the closure device to use the 18 instead of using a 14. No, no, uh, for sure. But, but you use Sapiens and you use Accurates? Yes, we do. Okay, so that is the that is uh, then you need to upsize because a 14 French e sheet is not 14 French, and a 14 French eye sleeve is not 14 French. So they are bigger. So you need to use an 18 French. Yes, but even for uh, 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 even for devices that use smaller smaller sheets. So that's uh, that, so then that is you, not. Do you guys use the, the 14 French? Yeah. Yeah, so I use 14 French for all my Evolute closures uh, and for uh, um, Impella uh, sheet closures. Then I would use 14s. Yeah, we you? do exactly the same, except of course the 34 uh, Evolute, which is an 80 French yeah. closure device. Yeah. yeah, I have the same experience as well. Yeah. But it's, it's important to stress that although you have a sheet that says 14 French, it doesn't mean that you can use the 14 French yeah. Yeah. But and, the, and these expandable yeah. sheets, they, yeah. they create bigger holes. Yeah, and we could see in our registry, actually, I didn't show that, but you could see the we had a, a, a actually significant uh, or, or almost significant uh, uh, more complications uh, in our balloon expandable experience. And the reason for this is that we only use the uh, 29 Sapien, which we all know is the largest right. mm. valve going in there. Although it goes in the 16 French, it it's becomes the hole becomes big. Yeah. When you look at the data in aggregate and analyze only the cases that were done on label with 14 for the appropriate sheaths and 18 for the appropriate sheaths, the complication rates are actually slightly lower in the 14 group, as you would expect yeah. with a slightly smaller hole, uh, with, with no paradoxical um, excess of complications, as you're suggesting. So I think it may be specific to, to the operators, small numbers. Mm. It's not seen in the large, larger uh, data sets. You know, it's also striking that uh, we've seen three to four percent major complication rates across the board it's in the yeah, randomized yeah. control yeah. trials in in yeah. our joint yeah. uh, efforts also, um, and that was also that triggered apparently also um, a participant in the audience because there was a suggestion: yeah, what if we would use a O14 coronary wire as a bailout access? Would that be helpful? Well, I. I'm interested in, in, in what you would think about that. I have, an, I have a relatively strong opinion on that, but I would be interested to... to well, I mean, this, this is one, maybe one of the drawbacks then with the device, obviously, is that you cannot reaccess the way it's designed today. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, that, that I think that it would be interesting to see whether there would be a possibility to maybe add another device in situations where you have 
have a bleeding because we also see that the majority of the complications are actually bleeding. So mm. stent because of bleeding is in over the, all the studies, the most by far the most uh, common complication. So. so, so what is your take, Stefan, uh, on, my, on the use of this coronary wire? Yeah, my take is that you go either contralateral or you do a second puncture. Ipsilateral. Yeah, so I agree. Um, I think the issue with uh, a wire through the collagen, because the collagen will be around, if you would try to use that wire to advance uh, a bailout proglide or angioseal, you obviously risk to push in the collagen and you will sure. create serious uh, issues mm -hmm. if the collagen enters the vessel. So I would recommend not to do that. Chris, do you have any comments on that? I have to be very careful what I say mm -hmm. here, of course. <laughs> um, I, it, it's all off-label, of course, what we're talking about here. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about that, what you're concerned about, and I'm also concerned in the reports of using a buddy wire beside, which has the capacity to displace the foot. So I, I think yeah, and when and until we have a, a, a true over-the-wire collagen foot yeah. system, that the contralateral approach is, is or second ipsilateral puncture is the appropriate bailout. Yeah, can I ask a question to all three of you? Because a, short you mentioned one, a short one, but because we are at the end oh, of the... Perfect. Uh, the so protamine in every patient, even if you have a fresh coronary stent, yes or no? Yes. Yes. When you want to use Manta, yes. Oh. <laughs> mm, I don't know. <laughs> we, uh, I, I give, don't know no, either. I, 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 I give protamine I to my CTOs with yeah. six or seven new stents. Okay. Yeah. 100 consecutive without a problem. But, you know, okay. there, is also, there are also other closure devices to be used yes, if you are of afraid of yeah. protamine. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, yeah. I, must, I, I would maybe use it if I see I have a oozing, a bleeding. I have, I have, but I would not use it up front. Okay. Okay. I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Will you do the closure? of the session? I will. Thank you very much to the faculty. Thank you for being here. Enjoyed it very much um, and, and look forward to, uh, to seeing you all. At the end. I think it's great that we almost close out PCR London Valves with a closure session. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.